name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is September 10th, 2021. Uh, it's 10 a.m. I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, so we're going to start uh, with a quick discussion of our mission and strategic vision statement. Um, we put this together uh, at our last meeting and um, we've received um, some good public input on it um, and we made some edits based on those comments and um, so we've now kind of put it I think put it up on our website or we'll be up there later today um, I just would say that this we don't find this to be a binding document it's more of a value statement um, that the board members crafted to help us understand what we believe our mission is um, and uh, allow give us something to refer back to when we're making decisions. Um, we drafted this document based on the priorities that we identified in our enabling legislation, as well as all of the testimony and comments we heard from people who will be impacted by the decisions that are made by the board. And so we consider this a living document. Um, we may update it from time to time as we hear from more people and as we learn more. But um, that being said, it should be up on our website, if not um, now, we'll soon. very soon. So um, before we get to the agenda, um, I think it's once again important um, for the benefit of the public to review some of the timelines of our advisory subcommittee meetings. Um, we have a very aggressive reporting requirement um, based on the enabling legislation and especially considering that our advisory committee was not seated until July. Um, we have two reports due in October, one in November, um, and we need to have our rules done uh, essentially as soon as possible. Um, these timelines mean that we have a very busy subcommittee schedule for the immediate future. Um, all of the schedules are posted on our website, but um, essentially the six subcommittees that are staffed by our consultants will meet on Mondays and Thursdays throughout the day. Um, we have two subcommittees, the lab testing subcommittee and the exploratory committee that are being staffed by the board and are meeting on more of an ad hoc basis. However, their agendas will be posted um, following the open meeting laws with, at least within 24 hours in advance. And, all of their minutes and recordings will be posted as well. Um, so just a quick note um, on kind of the live streaming issue of the subcommittees. I know that, you know that's an area that's caused a little bit of consternation. Um, I just want to say that the board is going to be holding weekly meetings just like this one on Fridays that are dedicated to reviewing all that was done in the subcommittees and really trying to digest uh, the work that the subcommittees have been doing and seek public comment on that. Um, the full advisory committees will be live streamed. Um, the subcommittees are also going to open each and every one of their meetings um, with reviewing all the public comments that have been received through our website. Um, the board, uh, like I said, is going to review their work every Friday and have public comment periods based on that discussion. And um, the board is also going to be holding after hours meetings once a month dedicated exclusively to public comment. Um, and then uh, there's also just a very significant public comment role to the rulemaking process. Uh, and I just would remind everyone that um, the subcommittees are acting in an advisory role. They're volunteer and they don't have any sort of binding decision making authority. They're providing recommendations to the full advisory committee um, who will further vet those recommendations and then make recommendations to the board. Um, whether we ultimately accept those recommendations, either fully, partially, or not at all, will depend on what we as a board are hearing from our consultants, from our staff, and from the public. And so to me, um, the comments that you make directly to us are the most impactful comments. Um, so I just want to lay all that out there and let you know that we are listening. Um, and with that, I would take, well, are we not going to approve the minutes, do you think, from the for advisory committee? committee? Should we wait till we have the full advisory committee back? I think so, yes. Okay. All right. So we're not going to approve the minutes from our meeting on 818, but we are going to turn to the agenda. So, 
Um, we've had six subcommittee meetings um, that were staffed by our consultants. We've had two other meetings of the lab safety subcommittee that were staffed by um, internally. And you know, the point of the, this meeting today, again, is to review what was covered in those meetings and then have the board and um, Bryn and David engage in a discussion to help shape and guide the subcommittees as they move through their tasks. So uh, I will just move straight to the agenda, which is a starting with Kyle to review the meetings that you sat in on, um, which I believe was the sustainability, the compliance, and the lab testing. Sure, um, I'll start with lab testing because that happened on Wednesday, lab testing is, is a leg up on a lot of our other subcommittees. They've met twice now and seem to be making really nice progress at this at this last meeting. Um, Kim and Carrie made contact with folks running labs in various jurisdictions um, on the western part of our country. Found that on average, uh, full panel testing typically is anywhere from $400 to $600. I think in California, um, it's as low as $300. Um, they're trying some automated system for lab testing, which can cut out, I guess, some human hour component of, of what all of that might cost. Um, the 400 to 600 dollar figure um, certainly was. Uh, it seemed to be a little concerning for subcommittee members, recognizing that we don't want lab testing to be cost prohibitive, especially for some of our our um, licensee holders that will be of the. the uh, craft cultivation variety. Um, so we're thinking through various different ways to potentially cut some lab testing costs. And there was some a, a range of ideas that were kind of thrown around. Kerry gave an overview on how his team at Ag typically uh, conducts uh, pesticide inspections and various other inspections, and, and what possibilities may exist to to do some stuff at that level versus in the lab, because pesticide testing is one of the most costly aspects of that full panel testing. Um, from an action item perspective, Kerry was gonna start drafting SOPs um, uh, for Kim's review. Largely, it seemed like they were moving in a direction where they would be taking the current hemp lab testing standards and looking to jurisdictions out west. Oregon was thrown around a lot and um, trying to incorporate some of what they do. They were gonna, uh, Carrie was gonna draft, Kim was gonna review. Um, they didn't really set another date for their um, for their next meeting. I think there's a lot of travel going on between the two of them, but they're gonna do that and then hope to review um, them more broadly with the public and with at the full subcommittee meeting the next time they meet, aiming for early to mid-October. Sustainability committee, um, you know, these were the first subcommittee meetings, a lot of introductions. I'm trying to get a lay of the land. I know Jacob was really trying to see from the Agency of Agriculture's perspective, the Agency of Natural Resources perspective, uh, various different program, the, the various different programs that kind of make up our robust environmental regulations to kind of get a starting point. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but how can this program slide into what's already existing? And uh, Jacob's going to do a gap analysis once he kind of under, understands that process uh, at ANR a little bit more substantively to see where um, we might need to do some more light work to slide this program into what's already going on in our existing environmental regulations. Um, I think the, the subcommittee is conscientious of not setting that environmental floor too high because there isn't various in incentive programs um, through different state agencies and Efficiency Vermont that really prioritize going above and beyond the regulatory floor. So making sure we get that right so folks can still take advantage of incentive programs, grant programs offered by the state to, to really help them move uh, the needle forward. Compliance and enforcement, um, you know, again, a lot of introductions. Um, I think the subcommittee is really understanding the brevity that, and the, the magnitude of all of what's um, been assigned to this subcommittee. Uh, if you're looking at it all at once, it's kind of hard to conceptualize how we can actually get to a finish line, but taking it in small chunks and recognizing we've got a lot of um, state agency partners with a lot of expertise and we can really lean on from certain perspectives, uh, I think gave a little bit of a calming <laughs> you know, sense um, to some of the, the committee members. Um, we, they prioritize certain stuff based off of you know, what we need to address first. So model local ordinance and fees was discussed. Um, 
I think that that's going to be discussed in multiple committees, maybe not as much on the fee aspect of things in the compliance and enforcement subcommittee, but especially local control, local ordinances, and that interaction between local and municipalities and uh, the Cannabis Control Board. Um, seed to sale tracking systems was brought up, um, retail compliance, indoor cultivation, outdoor cultivation, um, and enforcement. That was kind of where we got to in that meeting, starting to understand those ideas. I had shared that I have talked with the Agency of Agriculture's enforcement team, kind of get an overview of, of what they do and how they do things, and, and we have a charge in 164 to work through existing state agency partnerships to the extent that we're able to. Um, I've also shared that I talked to Liquor and Lottery to see how they do retail inspections. So um, that's kind of where where we ended things and good first meetings. How are towns, do you think, going to decide what is a reasonable fee for them to charge? I mean, what what are the and is that is that something that can happen quickly enough to match our deadlines in Act One Sixty Four? I mean, you have pretty significant. Uh, yeah, it depends on the town. I mean, there yeah. are towns that have you know fully fledged police forces and you know full time fire and rescue, and there are towns that are relying on the state for for a police force. So in terms of the cost, you know, it's very very different. It'll also depend on the density of potentially a retail. You know, if you have four or five retailers in a small town, it might be more than if you have one retailer in a large town. So it really depends. Um, on the structure of the town and then sort of the concentration of the businesses in the town. Yeah, the, uh, Tim Wessel, member of the subcommittee, pointed to the alcohol tax and how that's not sufficient to cover a lot of what's re required of a town to actually um, enforce the laws of the state as it relates to police, fire, so on and so forth, as it relates to alcohol consumption and alcohol sales. And I know that he is interested in trying to come up with costs that can help cover um, you know, the money that the town spends on ensuring that this this program is done safely within the bounds of a town, but but you know, the, we never really got to what that number may or may not look like. I think Carrie uh, Jaguer, another member of this subcommittee, said he, when he, in his experience setting costs, they look to just set the cost of um, from the state level, keeping the the program that's being regulated funding that program specifically and not all of these ancillary costs like fire department, police enforcement, so on and so forth that will inevitably come when you're, you know, even, even if it's a special cannabis event that requires you to close streets, so on and so forth. Um, so I think that there's a wide range of, of opinions on how to best set those costs, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll look to future meetings on yeah, well, and how that's actually going to happen. I'd like you guys or whoever is in that to just focus in on what exactly those actual costs are. I mean, I mean, are they worried about increased traffic? Are they worried about like repaving their roads more quickly because of that traffic? Are they, like, are they worried about like public disturbances um, or like public consumption that is going to require like you know? Police enforcement. I, I, I just, uh, to me, I just would like to know what's reasonable and why, because ultimately, we're the ones that have to make that determination and recommend something to the legislature. Absolutely. And I'm, I know whoever has to make that recommendation is going to be asked, well, what is this actually funding? So right. some of those questions will come up through this municipal engagement process yeah. that we've started. Yeah. So one of the questions on the survey is, does your town anticipate that? doing the licensing or doing the zoning for this is above and beyond what other businesses require. And sorry, I forgot to mention that in my overview of that meeting. Okay. Julie did put together a survey <laughs> that went out to every municipality in the state of Vermont yeah. um, that's going to ask them questions ranging from, are you, are you planning to put this on the ballot? Um, and if so, you know, what are your thoughts and vision for this looking like in your respective town. The second step of that process is to add some qualitative information yeah. to the data yeah. that comes in, which is where I think we can ask yeah. some of those questions. Yeah, I do worry about a little bit of the timing yeah. um, because, you know, the fees, I think, will have to be approved. And if, you know, the towns aren't giving us the feedback in time for our fee bill, then um, there's going to have to be some kind of language in there about the local fees. Yeah. But... 
All right. Well, that's good. We'll take that with. Well, I'll take that with me as I sit in on Monday. Yeah. How far down the road did you guys get on sea to sail? Not really. Yeah. Um, anywhere. I think the model local ordinances and fees and that structure did take up a majority okay. of the time yeah. yesterday. Um, Tim had a lot to share from his perspective sitting on the Brattleboro Select Board. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Um, and you know how it's it's different for him. He's got a hundred, so give or take, and employees working for Brattleboro, but recognizing that's different than, than smaller towns in Vermont that don't have that same luxury. So, but we didn't arrive at any specifics in the first meeting. But yeah, we'll continue moving on that. Yeah, I mean, an hour is quick. Yeah, so a lot to cover in this one. Um, on the testing. Was there any discussion about expanding state capacity to kind of have subsidized testing for small cultivators? There's been discussion on it. Um, I know that that, that service is not a fee for service is not offered through the hemp program. Yeah. I know Kerry has considered it. Um, there's been other, you know, whether it's sliding fees to, to you know, processors and larger cultivators to help yeah. offset costs to smaller cultivators was also discussed. Um, I'd say that's not out of the realm of possibility, but I think um, that doesn't seem to be the direction that they're they're zeroing in on. Okay. At this point in time. And really, what we've tasked them with is coming up with the standards, not necessarily how to expand capacity. Correct. Yeah. And you know, it's my understanding that Vale and Randolph does have some capacity. Do they have capacity to be that? player for the entire industry, that's a question for Carrie. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But they're, they're certainly focused on keeping fees as nominal relatively as they possibly can. Yeah. And finding ways to short circuit the traditional full panel mm -hmm. testing system that exists in other, in other states. Are they discussing, you know, the things that absolutely need to be tested for consumer protection versus the things that maybe we would like to have tested for, you know, marketing purposes and things like that. So if people want to market that their product has a certain terpene in it, you know, are they talking about that sort of? So full panel testing includes potency, pesticides, solvents, microbials, metals, water activity, moisture percentage, and foreign matter. Um, terpenes would be optional. So terpenes yeah. aren't in included in that four hundred to six hundred dollar figure. That's an additional cost that, you know, if you depending on how you want to market your product, you might yeah. you might look to include. I think we've heard from Carrie or Stephanie that these licenses should be issued as soon as possible, pretty much, because um, you don't want this to be a bottleneck, and you need to know how much testing capacity there is going to be. Yeah, I know. My my perspective is I know that there is a sequential order of of licenses laid out and. Our authorizing legislation, but moving this to the front of the line, if we're able to, will give a lot of folks clarity on what is to be expected yeah. from a testing perspective before you know they get to the point of of having to to go get tested. Right. And <clears throat> I think I understand correctly, right, that people can vertically integrate, but not horizontally. Like so you like, couldn't have multiple lab. And each license is intended to be one location. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. We can double check that, but yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. So that you're saying that, I wonder if yeah, that might be a way. If an exception for labs might be a way of having more labs either expand or yeah. having more labs open. It's a great question. I know I know Carrie's of the opinion and we as a board have not reached out to every single lab that's that's um, working in our hemp industry to find out their intentions for this market. Um, I think we have anecdotal evidence that they're planning on stepping in here, but we don't know that for sure. So um, we should probably do some outreach to labs to get their in, get their intent um, to service this this new market. Great. Well, do you need any more direction from us? I mean, I, I feel like you know. I think. I think. I think we're good at this point. I'll have more to report next week. I think um, the Compliance and Enforcement Subcommittee is definitely feeling like they have 
a lot on their plate. So I think that's going to be a, a tag team approach from yeah. the three of us to, to keep that on the rails. Yeah, I mean, I think that the idea was once some of these other subcommittees somewhat wrap up, that we can move more and more people into compliance and enforcement. And yeah. I think Tom did a good job of setting out what we need first versus kind of if we're going to do kind of rules on a rolling basis to a certain extent, then, you know, what we need first. Next. I agree. I think, you know, the market analysis, that first deadline is going to really snowball effect a lot of these other subcommittees work. And I think if you look at the list of what's required of this subcommittee, it's extensive, but it's also where we can leverage the most agency partnerships yeah. throughout state government. So I think if you start thinking through it from that lens and we can work through some MOUs with other agencies and understand how they're, they would approach this, um, it's not going to seem as you know, oh my gosh, as it did to some of the subcommittee members when they first yeah. looked at the list yesterday. Yeah. Great. Well, Julie, you sat in on the social equity and the public health subcommittees. I did. Um, I'll start with public health. So I, I think Kyle sort of talked about this a little bit. This is really a table setting day. So there were a lot of introductions, review of the you know relevant portions of Act 164 and Act 62. Um, and kind of a framing of goals for, for the public health subcommittee. Um, they have sort of a three-phase process where they're going to talk about first um, the marketing and advertising and packaging, um, and their goal is to sort of limit uh, youth interest in those uh, products and uh, misuse among adults. Um, the next phase uh, goes further into packaging and labeling and the, the standard symbol for, for cannabis that will be on packages and then the dates and the shelf life. And then, of course, the, the POS flyer, uh, point of sale flyer that will be handed out at um, retailers is also part of their conversation. So they really spent time framing the conversation and looking a little bit about um, what's happened in other states and talking about how the process will roll out, looking at sampling packaging. Um, one suggestion from, I think it was Dr. Levine, was providing <coughs> samples of, you know, uh, marketing that's acceptable or advertising that's acceptable and then examples of things that are absolutely prohibited to make it very clear for folks. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about the, the fee that the board may charge for, for reviewing um, advertising, but that was really sort of ancillary to the discussion of how it will all be regulated. Um, <clears throat> and then in social equity, um, you know, again, it was a table setting meeting, but it, it, there was a lot to unpack in terms of what's happened in other states. Um, and they looked a little bit at what NACB's um, standards are. Um, and if you think back to the meeting that we had on the 18th, NACB spends a lot of time building their standards. And so they went through um, and introduced the standards that they have. Um, and really what they did was start defining the questions, you know, what will be a social equity applicant, how will that be applied, um, you know, what are the criteria, and then talked about the difference between um, advancing social equity applicants and then, you know, broader diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, programming. So that was sort of where that, that committee began. So uh, back to the, the public health, and <clears throat> this is just something that came up in the sustainability committee. We didn't really get too far into any environmental mediums like water, air, energy, so on and so forth, but waste was kind of discussed. And from a sustainability perspective, waste in the in the 50 milligram packaging limit that we have, I think the subcommittee um, you know, talked a little bit about the 50 milligram packaging limit is isn't found in very many other jurisdictions. I'm sh sure that that limit was put in for public health reasons, but it also will create a lot more plastic waste as we look to unfold this market. So um, just wanted to share that, yeah, that's a good point. that point um, to the Public Health Committee. So on this social equity, I mean, it's a very aggressive deadline. Again, I hate to keep saying that, but it really is. And to me, that kind of flies in the face of uh, an inclusive, you know, you know, process inclusivity and equity. Um, do you feel like they're on track, and do you feel like there's enough going to be enough opportunity for public engagement? At this point, I would say I feel like they're on track. Mm -hmm. um, but as always with social equity, there's so much to unpack. 
Yeah. So it, it may be possible that you know they get further into this conversation and find that there's more to unpack than can be unpacked in, yeah. in three or four weeks in order to do this in a way that's really going to be effective. One thing that they talked a lot about was the point of the social equity program in cannabis is to repair harm. And if we speed through too much and we gloss over repairing harm, have we really done something effective? So I'm not worried about it yet, but I, yeah. I, you know, I'm keeping an eye on that as well. Yeah, I think part of their charge is creating a public engagement plan. Mm -hmm. And I know that Gina has talked to us about that a little bit. Um, yeah. But I wouldn't want that to fall by the wayside in order just to meet a deadline. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, any any like in depth discussion about constitutional issues with with this? I know. Oh yes, there Ohio, was, yes. Ohio has been sued. <laughs> um, yeah. So they talked a little bit about Ohio, um, and it was the the dormant commerce clause, co commerce clause that um, you know really sort of came up in the conversation about residency requirements. Mm -hmm. Can you have resi residency requirement? If you're too restrictive in your social equity programs, what does that mean constitutionally and you know legally? Mm -hmm. And then you know the time and attention that the board might have to spend on you know looking at legal attention versus actually rolling out a program. Yeah, yeah I sat in on this meeting, and, and those are issues that we're going to have to to work through and make sure we're we're confident enough and. Our social equity program that we're comfortable rolling it out knowing that that some folks might seek to challenge it coming in from out of state so you know I wonder if there's going to be objective criteria like if you have a criminal conviction or a family member does for a drug offense and if there's going to be subjective criteria as well like kind of explain how you were harmed um, by the war on drugs or prohibition um, and how we would the objective criteria is so much e somewhat easier to deal with, but if there is going to be a subjective criteria section, how we as a board are going to score those or consider those, right. I think it would be also important for this subcommittee to give us a recommendation yeah. on. I would also love to see this subcommittee give us a recommendation on how we approve social equity applicants in general. Yeah. Um, should it just be the three of us, or should there be an additional process that's a little bit more inclusive? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good that's point. That's a good point. And I know it's on their list, but also the transferability of these licenses and what that means for the kind of, as ownership changes hands, what that means for, you know, the benefits that social equity applicants get. Okay, great. Anything else you want to bring up? Anything you need from us? No. Okay. Well, we actually all sat in on the market structure subcommittee. Um, so, but essentially, this was, you know, introductions. This committee is tasked with um, looking at licensure, what types of licenses we need, what sort of uh, demand uh, there is in the state, and what that means for how much canopy we're going to need, and what that decision means for how many testing facilities, product manufacturers, uh, retailers, and other types of licenses. Um, VS Strategies, Andrew Livingston, um, has put together a very impressive model um, you, to kind of estimate demand, but it does certainly a lot more than that. Um, and it's demand, both uh, in-state demand, it's uh, tourism demand, and it's bordering state demand. And he has been kind of collecting data, in-state and um, out-of-state data, um, using the national, what is it, the National Drug Use and Health Survey, um, tourism data, uh, dispensary data, and census data. Um, the model also includes any number of these adjustable assumptions um, related to kind of what products people are going to be interested in. Um, when cultivators are putting their seeds in the ground or clones and how that impacts our initial supply, um, how much indoor cultivation there's going to be versus mixed light or outdoor, and all of these kind of impact what the supply is and what the potential bottlenecks along the supply chain and value added chain might be. Um, I know it goes into much more depth than that, but I think this was really kind of an overarching um, 
kind of preview for us. Uh, he's suggested that we all kind of dig in and kind of play around with the model. Um, and just for the folks watching, this model is pretty big data-wise. So we're working on getting it up on the website, but right now, if uh, anyone wants it emailed to them, you can email nelly.marvel at vermont.gov, and she'll get it to you. Um, so, I mean, this is kind of an incredible resource that we have. How, what it means, it's kind of a little daunting to really wrap our heads around how we use it best. Um, I think, essentially, what I mean, one of the big takeaways that I got, uh, and I might be a little bit off on this, but it sounds like we need, in order to ensure that we meet demands and not in outer years have a um, large overstock, oversupply, is to have between 300 and 400,000 square feet of canopy, roughly. Um, and so, of course, that led one of our advisory committee members, Savan, to ask that what I consider to be the you know, most important question is, if we had only medium and small cultivators, can they meet that 300 to 400,000 square feet of canopy? Is it like, is there, are there enough of them going to come forward uh, in order to do that? Um, so to me, that was one of the big takeaways. We didn't get a real opportunity to dig into that question because reviewing the model took the entire time. Um, and so I think that that's going to be the starting point of next week's discussion. Um, so it's, I, I don't know, you both were in there. Is there anything you want to add to that? Not, not really. I think I think playing with the model and, and get, after we got the overview, letting the subcommittee members, um, Savan and, and others, kind of uh, play with it and, and try and zone. Another thing I heard from him was like zoning in on an, on the right assumptions to make sure that we do the best that we can in getting th these predictions right the first time. So how do we how do we take assumptions and turn them into um, something that's less assumption, a little bit more predictable at various points throughout this process. I'm also interested, like, you know, that model um, certainly favored indoor cultivation, and I get that. <clears throat> I wanna, and, and the outdoor components of it, obviously, because you're more tied to specific growing seasons peaked at certain points throughout the year, and, and is there opportunities from an outdoor perspective to kind of um, not be so so concentrated at points of the year and spread that out? I don't know. Um, can we take shelf life of a product into consideration when it comes to an outdoor growing um, modeling perspective? So, um, but I was impressed with the model. I thought it's a good starting point for us and I'm excited to see the work that the subcommittee is gonna do and, and, and honing in on what's gonna make the most sense for us. You know, it's interesting that model even can predict supply and demand in states like New York come online and what that means for the future. Um, it's not just straight up supply demand that takes all of those ancillary impacts of Connecticut, New York, so on and so forth. Folks that might be coming here for tourism, you know, related purposes, but might be bringing their own product. One thing that I thought about last night, and I didn't see represented in that model is Canadian tourists coming into the United States. They aren't gonna be able to, to it's legal in, in Canada. You can buy at a dispensary in Canada, in Quebec, but you can't cross the federal border quite as easily as you can state borders. And so I didn't see that data represented in the model, and I don't know if, if it was, and we just... You know, I think it's because he was using this National Survey of Drug Use and Health about the bordering states yeah. and the regions, and I doubt that they just have the data. But that's a big kind of... Yeah, but there's a lot of Canadians that come here to ski. Right. Um, so I'd like to see that data represented if it's possible to do so. I'd also like to see the next step in the supply chain related yeah. to retailers because we have only 26 towns-ish right now yeah. that have um, voted to include retail and I think it's great that we're trying to figure out the supply and demand in terms of the product but how we're going to get it then to market right. um, is the next step. And I know that we talked about in our prevention meeting about the concentration of retailers in certain areas, so I'm mindful of that. Okay. But the model even, you know, uh, predicts 
if something's on the shelf life for too long, it needs to turn into a concentrate, product lost in manufacturing and, and you know, uh, packaging, stuff like that. So it's it gets pretty granular. I was, um, it was impressive. My experience with Excel is I could never in a million years come up with something like that. So I'm glad that there's people out there that can. I think I stepped out of this one early to get ready for the next one. Have they talked about employment data at all in terms of how the, you know, how where employees are going to come from for various different uh, types of establishments? No, they did not talk about that. And I know, um, you know, we offered to put them in touch with the Department of Labor, but um, I think for the purposes of this model, they were just focused on the supply and demand. Yeah. It's kind of an ancillary question that should be certainly considered. Yeah, all right. Well, it, it's a fascinating model, and the more we can play around with it, I think the more educated we'll be as the, um, as, and of course, it changes depending on concentrates. You know, he I think had a very low number of concent, you know, percentage of products sold to concentrates because of the 60% right, limit um, compared to other states that don't have that. You know, and so you know all of the can all of the numbers change based upon how the assumptions are entered. So that three to four hundred thousand might not be accurate. It might be more if concentrates at greater than 60% were allowed. Mm -hmm. Is that a, well, let's say that that 60% did change in the future, does this model have the ability for us to change that assumption, or is that kind of ingrained in the model? Do you, I, think I don't have it in front of me. just change, like, like, I think you had concentrates at 4% of the market, whereas in Massachusetts, they're closer to 20%, so yeah. I think you can just change that for Okay, I didn't know if that was kind of built in, or if that's something that you could play around with as you well. You can make the assumption that there okay. would be more sold. You did mention it's a lot more complicated than that because people that can't get the concentrates are going to buy more, potentially buy more flour or bring them from other states. So it's hard. Like he said it's, it's not as easy as that, but you know you can make sure. some basic okay. assumptions. Um, the medical subcommittee met. Um, the the real theme of that subcommittee is how to protect the viability of the medical program um, once the dispensaries which are now for-profit, um, and once they're allowed to participate in the adult use market, because the kind of economies of scale on the medical side are much lower, and yet there's a number of really specialized products um, that need to be made for you know, a small number of people. And yet if you have kind of a you know, large segment of the population that's going to adult use, how do you ensure the kind of continuity of services and products um, to the medical folks? I think that was really kind of my overarching theme and takeaway from that. Um, but then they went into the kind of specifics about expanding access, um, which includes kind of, there's a provision in the medical law that says you have to have a three month relationship with your doctor before you can, um, before they can make a referral. And you know, does that really make sense when we have an adult use marketplace uh, operating alongside this? Um, you know, some expanding the qualifying conditions. There's a lot of discussion about um, whether or not qualifying conditions should just be based upon a doctor's recommendation. You know, there's no defined list. It's just if the doctor thinks that this could be helpful, um, then you can try it out. Um, the designated dispensary rule doesn't seem to make a lot of sense when you have, you know, there's no designated adult use retailers. So, what, you know, when you're thinking about it, Expanding access, that seems like an easy one. Um, the purchasing caps, I think it's one ounce per month at the dispensaries. Um, there's a decent amount of talk about homegrown caregivers, um, and I think that there needs to be more discussion on that. I think, you know, sure, you know, not everyone who is on the dispensary can just grow their own, um, but I do think that there are ways where people that have expertise in growing should be allowed to grow from just more than one person. Um, and I think that uh, there was some confusion on that um, about whether or not that was a good idea or not. But I, I think that, you know, I mean, we, we've, we've seen Jessie Lynn talk about this and, you know, how she, um, you know, can only grow for one person. So, you know, she kind of, when it has more people coming to her, she kind of 
can give them some clones or something, but that's about all she can do. Um, there is definitely a theme around uh, more diversity of products. Uh, you know, there is some frustration amongst the patients that at the dispensaries are very limited in the amount of strains that they have. Um, I'm trying to think, it was it was very much an introductory meeting, um, but. You know, we do have a report due in November uh, to the legislature around the makeup of the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee and what their mission should be as they continue to engage with the board. And um, we, of course, are taking on the medical program January 1st. Uh, and then the rules are set to expire um, in on March 1st. So, again, we're going to need to have kind of a plan in place uh, for for both November, January, and March, um, and everything is through the lens of. To me, everything's through the lens of. If the, the current dispensaries are now operating in this other field, you know, how do we make sure that uh, they? I mean, how do we make sure that they continue to provide the services and products that um, that the patients need? So this, this group will eventually talk about the composition of the um, oversight. Symptom relief oversight. So, yeah. Yep. Um, is there any discussion about adding other medical professionals, chiropractors, or um, other types of, or do you think there will be any? Yes. You know, I've been sitting in on the med the, the symptom relief oversight committee meetings also, just as a kind of, they're operating outside of our advisory committee, but um, they have to make a recommendation to us I think by October um, on this. And so, yes, that is, you know, they, it, they want it to be patient and physician-led, medical, me medical professional-led, and that includes naturopaths, chiropractors, um, but also just patient, patients of various interests, because they're not, you know, their interests aren't all the same. Like some patients can't afford the dispensaries, and yet the current makeup of the marijuana for symptom relief oversight, all of the patients are people that use the dispensaries. Um, you know, people with terminal conditions have different interests than people um, with mental health conditions. The only mental health condition currently is PTSD. But, um, so, you know, I think that they're really looking at how do you make a representative board or committee so that when you know, when we're hearing from the chair on this advisory committee or when they're giving us recommendations, we can feel confident that, you know, all interests are being represented to the best that they can. So they're, they're in the midst of that work. I don't know if it's bled over into this subcommittee quite yet, but I think when we have that recommendation from them, it can be kind of an agenda item mm -hmm. for this, um, for this subcommittee. Sounds good. So any direction for this committee that you want to see? I mean, I think the, the main question is the one that I posed, is how the long-term viability, um, and what does that look like? I think expanding access, uh, I mean, expanding kind of the amount of people that can participate, not making it such a narrow kind of passageway in order to get onto the registry is one helpful way to do it. You know, you can kind of increase the number of patients, increase the market size, but, um, it's never going to be able to fully compete with you know, right. mm -hmm. all of the adult use. I, I, I just agree with one of the comments or, or suggestions that you had when it comes to caregivers and, and home grow and making sure that's a part of the conversation and that we're not strictly focusing on the medical dispensaries. I think that's, that needs to be um, understood that that's what the board wants yeah. um, at the subcommittee level. Yeah. I think ensuring access for, and maybe this is further down the road, but like you were talking about expanding access for those who are using um, cannabis for substance abuse yeah. as a treatment process. Um, I think that's really important. That and sort of some sort of standardized um, knowledge base or education, whether it's a yeah. you know an access to a nurse or a nurse hotline or um, something like that. And I, I don't know that that specifically relates to medical or just you know, anybody who is using cannabis for right. a medical reason that maybe, you know, maybe it's just to sleep in right. but access to information. Yeah, I mean, of, of course, the, like, on the access piece, uh, there is always the default 
that some states do that you can use your medical card at an adult use recreational dispensary and you don't pay tax. I don't know what the implication is for like you're paying with a credit card how to exactly to do that um, or a debit card, but um, you know, but of course the problem with that is that the, the adult use dispensaries are limited in the products that they can deliver and some of the products that they're prohibited from doing are the ones that are most uh, important for patients, um, and so it's not it's it's not like it's not the like key to this. It can help, but it's not the key. Well, I left. I think that's good for the kind of review. I did leave some time on um, on the agenda for David and Bryn to give us any comments that they might they might have or any questions that they have for the board, any, any things that you need from us as we move forward? Yep, so I do have a couple things. Um, the first is that I really, as we all do, have my eye on meeting the deadlines that are laid before us. And to that end, I think it's really important that the subcommittees um, are able to hear from who they need to hear from. Um, I heard in a couple of the subcommittees that they, um, it would be helpful to them to hear from some of our partners in state government or other stakeholders. So if, if um, I'm making a note of those and facilitating that, um, if, if I'm not in a subcommittee and you are, if you could please let me know so I can facilitate that process because I think that will go a long way to um, helping them make the decisions they need to make in a timely fashion. Brian, on that, I think you were in a couple of the subcommittees where that was yeah. certainly brought up. I think, I don't know, I can't remember if you were in compliance and enforcement, but Carrie brought Dave Huber, who's the head of yeah. enforcement for the agency of ag, and we never got to a point where I thought he could really have a substantive conversation on his approach to, you know, inspections, at least of the outdoor cultivation perspective. Um, it'd be great to have him back next week to dig into that a little bit more. Yeah. So I, I think that's just communicating through Carrie that Dave's available Monday or Thursday. Um, yeah. And I, I don't can, I don't want to get ahead of Tom and the, the moderators or NACB and, and what they have planned for the agenda, but I think hearing from some of our partners on how they approach certain things will be very helpful. Yep. And that's just what I mean, because if you let me know, I can let the consultants know that we need to build the agenda around who the committee needs to hear from. Yeah, he joined and never got an opportunity. So um, <laughs> I want to be respectful of his time, obviously. but. Um, bringing them back would be very helpful, I think. Okay, great. Um, and the other thing is that uh, as you're you know, listening to the work that the subcommittees are doing um, and you're thinking about policy, um, if you could also think about like the building of the, of the staff of the board, um, because I've just, you know, I heard it in a couple uh, subcommittees, obviously in compliance and enforcement, but also in social equity, I think there are, um, Depending on the policy decisions that are made, that's going to inform the the staffing of the agency, and I, all these things are going to need to be happening at once. So, if you could um, keep a special eye on that as well, uh, that would be helpful to me, and I will do the same. Um, and the last thing I have is just I know that we are going to um, provide that model by request, but I just wanted to note for the public that we will not be in a position to answer questions about that model. Um, important note. Yes. And that's all for me. Great. Did you want to add? Uh, I don't have a lot to add. I think the board, the only thing I would add is uh, the board was right to note some of the constitutional questions we're going to have to work through, and um, certainly something I have my eye on and we'll be uh, discussing further. And that's social equity, but a broader comment as well. Hey, that's right. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, great. Well, um, we have about 10 minutes for public comment. Um, we have a few members in the room. I feel like I should prioritize the people that showed up. Uh, so why don't we do that? Do you mind sitting in this chair so you can get on the camera? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, will this be the last chance for public comment in the meeting? Or? For this meeting, yeah. For this meeting? Yeah, great. All right, my name is Joshua Decatur. I'm a member of the uh, Vermont uh, Cannabis uh, Equity Coalition. Um, and uh, no, thank you for having us here today. Very exciting that the subcommittees are underway. 
Um, after listening to the piece of the meeting I was able to hear just now, uh, spending some time with our coalition and the community, um, I think I just want to uh, underscore some of the, the concerns again around um, access to the market uh, and that social equity is not something that can live in its own little bubble. It really ripples through all the decisions um, and you know, basically every subcommittee that meets probably should talk about social equity and how it applies to the job that that subcommittee is doing from a lot of different angles, from racial equity angles, from uh, agricultural angles, from uh, just considering uh, uh, you know, local Vermonter uh, rights versus multi-state, multinational corporation rights to access the market. Um, this, is gonna, this is a theme for our coalition. It's a theme in the conversation around cannabis in, in general. Um, and uh, you know, the more uh, I think that this board can do to protect the interests of Vermonters and, you know, for lack of a better word, the little people in the market uh, versus the larger uh, corporations and entities, the better results we'll get for Vermonters uh, and uh, for the health of our consumers in the state um, and uh, for the market as a whole, which will translate to success across the board, whether that's talking about tax revenue or participation in transition from the illicit market. Um, and it, uh, I just want to underscore that opportunity because Vermont did hold off for many years before launching this legal market with the justification being we can learn from other states and we can see what they do first. We don't want to be the first state to charge into the unknown. Um, and now that we're here, there is a lot of feedback about what does and doesn't work. Uh, it's pretty clear the way that equity programs have been done up to this point have not worked great. It's pretty clear that uh, the way local small businesses have been fostered through uh, entering the market has not been great. Um, and I just don't think that it is a uh, Vermont's ethic to sell an industry like this out to the highest bidder. Um, it's more important to stand up for what's right, stand up for our local communities, and acknowledge that part of legalizing cannabis is acknowledging the injustice that was perpetuated for over 100 years, just about 100 years, uh, of people uh, across the country, especially black and brown uh, folks as well. So, um, you know, I, I, uh, I'll leave my public comment at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Jeffrey? Sure. Hello, everybody. Uh, Jeffrey Pizzatello. Uh, good to see everybody once again. Um, Vermont Growers Association and uh, Vermont uh, Cannabis Equity Coalition. Josh is a colleague of mine in that coalition. Uh, three quick points. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, first point, um, with regards to canopy size and uh, analysis of demand for the state, um, we have a uh, VGA has an annual policy survey. The first year we issued our survey, we fielded over 350 unique respondents. And in one of those questions, we asked what the average canopy size is. They returned 1,200 square feet. So just thinking about those numbers and other metrics that we have as well in our organization, over 300 respondents averaging over 1,000 square feet themselves that they admitted to. We're projecting our current legacy market robust is, it as, is over 500,000 square feet currently and has been for a while. So just some numbers to share with you guys. Um, we are heartened to hear about uh, outdoor cultivation and considering that as uh, an item in successfully leading our marketplace. Uh, we think we did a really good job and you guys will uh, see our proposed recommendations in defining uh, unique allotments for outdoor cultivation. For instance, in our definition of commercial cultivation, we include a ratio, uh, a one, two, four ratio, so for every 1,000 square feet indoor, that's 2,000 square feet mixed light, and 4,000 square feet outdoor. That uh, addresses things like seasonality and other concerns that were brought up. Um, lastly, uh, with regards to medical, um, this was brought up yesterday, uh, the notion of patient to, to caregiver allowances is, 
is finding success uh, in other states. Uh, so this is nothing new. It's no longer considered innovative or too edgy. We would urge you guys to consider that for decentralizing the medical marketplace. Uh, thanks. Thank you. All right, so anyone who is uh, joined by the link, um, please raise your virtual hand. I think I saw Dave's hand go up first. Yes, Dave is first. Uh, thanks, James. Um, I, uh, I'm fascinated by the market analysis and I look forward to uh, diving into it, but um, I'm, I'm a little um, confused, I guess, as to how uh, you're planning on using it and whether you're planning on setting a cap on the number of licenses uh, to be issued to growers. And, and if so, I'd love to understand what your thoughts are on where in the enabling statute you think you're drawing your authority to set that cap, because I don't see it. Um, and James, as, as you recall from um, your, your history uh, of, of working on cannabis legislation, S-241 had specific numbers of licenses to be issued and granted and would have granted it, the regulator under that bill uh, authority to expand the number and, and determine a number of licenses. Uh, H-490 uh, in, in, in 2017 would have done something similar. Uh, but Act 164 doesn't have a set number of licenses and in my view doesn't ask you to determine a number of licenses instead it asks you to determine qualifications for licenses and issue licenses to qualified applicants and so i'm just a little unsure as to where you're heading with that and i was i was hoping you might be able to clarify um thanks for the comment david i, I would say stay tuned to the uh subcommittee structure as they start to dig in on that. Um, I think Tito is next? Yes, Tito's next. Hi there. Um, I, I'd like to uh, talk today about uh, some really, really disturbing advancements on the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee meeting that happened on Wednesday. And we really missed you being there, Chair Pepper. And it seemed as though um, some of the board or some of the panel members seem extremely, extremely motivated to keep licensed caregivers out of the conversation and to not and to keep them from having a seat at the table. Uh, one of them even uh, seemed to have an extremely heavy bias and even used derogatory insults uh, towards me and other uh, licensed caregivers, which I was personally insulted by. It was it was really something else. Uh, and it went so far that uh, some of the it seems like the, the MS rock committee actually wants to change the definition of what a caregiver is uh, from somebody who uh, uh, grows uh, medical cannabis for a patient and actually switch it to just mean a parent or guardian. Uh, it was really fascinating and really disturbing. And, 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 and to anybody else out there listening, any caregivers uh, out there now, um, you've got to come to these, to these meetings and, and let your voice be heard because it's going in a, in a really bad direction, in my opinion. And I just need to shed some light on that. Thank you. Thanks, Tito. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed it. Amelia, next. Amelia? Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to make a couple points really quickly. Uh, I know, James, you touched on medical patients being able to get their products from adult use dispensaries and how we don't really know how that would look right now. Um, and I think that the complications around that are super valid. So if we get to a point where we can't really make that work, where we can't get these THC caps raised, things like that, then what we need to turn our focus to is looking at the fact that Vermont will not allow another medical dispensary to open until there are 7,000 registered patients on the registry. Um, and that needs to be changed, <laughs> clearly. Um, competition is what's going to allow affordability. It's going to increase the quality of products. It's going to increase accessibility, and it's going to increase 
the like you said the dispensaries don't have a great variety of product and if there were more competition within that medical space that amount of product choice would increase by a lot um and then the second thing i just wanted to say uh that i think i said to you james but i just wanted to say it to everybody is specifically on my end with regard to the medical subcommittee just be very very aware of where the recommendations and suggestions are coming from within these subcommittees because the advisory board is not a group of people that you guys chose like each one of these members was recommended by a different person it's not like a group that you guys put together of cannabis experts and everybody who was you know the best person for that job um and it really concerns me <laughs> that our patient representative on that subcommittee who is jim who has i think been doing a great job from the oversight committee uh, he was selected by the same dispensary that meg also represents and so that's two people who essentially represent the same dispensary and then two doctors whose expertise is not necessarily in the uh, administration of cannabis for symptom relief or even the cultivation of cannabis to be used in a medical context. So the amount of knowledge within that subcommittee or the amount of experience and patient advocacy, in my opinion, is limited um, so I, I just think that's something to keep in mind when you're receiving recommendations from these subcommittees is the personal expertise and experience of the people that are on them. Um, and that was all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Amelia. Anyone else uh, with a public comment, um, please feel free to raise just your virtual hand. Okay. We have two joined by phone. Oh, sorry. If you've joined by phone and you'd like to make a comment, I, I think it's star six to unmute yourself. Neither is unmuted. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we'll keep doing these on Fridays. Um, we're going to be posting our subcommittee meetings. They were, they were all recorded yesterday. We'll be posting them as quickly as, as we can. We've been working with Orca Media. Um, who has kind of secondary backup um, or uh, to post those as well. So um, I guess if there's no more public comment, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye.